Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this very important webinar. We are hopeful that the information that is shared today um, will be very useful to you. And so with that, um, we just want to make a note that um, we're going to um, provide as much information as we can um, in the discussion, but we're also leaving time for um, questions at the end. If you could go to the next slide, please. Just wanting to make sure that we cover some of our general housekeeping up front. Um, first, um, we are keeping the Q&A feature open for the duration of the session. Do not wait until we're at that point. Feel free to throw in questions throughout. Uh, we will be tracking those and making sure that we can answer all of those questions throughout, but especially towards the end. Um, feel free to also use the chat to submit thoughts along the way. We are recording the webinar. Um, after the webinar is complete, we will make sure that it is publicly available to you. Um, and we will share these slides with all of the registrants via email um, after the event as well. So just to level set um, and make sure that we all know why we're here and what we are seeking to achieve. Um, first and foremost, we wanna make sure that this is a forum for you all. Um, the goal is to make sure that primary care providers have the, the space to be able to learn more about COVID-19 monoclonal antibody therapeutics, ask questions, um, but also hearing from some of your peers about the availability, the impact of the mobs and how they've been used um, in a clinical setting, um, and also being able to learn some of the best practices from those providers as well. Um, and as we proceed and towards the end of this, you'll also see some of the immediate resources and tools that we want you to be able to walk away with. Um, and we also have other resources on our website that we'll make sure are available to you when we send those slides. So for those of you who um, are new um, to working with Healthcare Ready, just want to start by, by welcoming you. Um, and, and we do hope that we can continue to serve as a um, useful partner to you. Um, Healthcare Ready is an organization that's almost 15 years old. It actually started as an informal partnership after Hurricane Katrina, focused on making sure that public-private partnerships um, were the mainstay of health supply chain coordination and response. Um, so our job was to make sure that there could be ongoing coordination um, before, during, and after events to ensure that patients had consistent access to health care um, and medicines. And so with that, um, our mandate is around what we like to call all hazards preparedness. Um, and we sit at the intersection of public and private, but also between emergency management and health care and public health. We do a range of activities, especially during response. And this slide just shows um, a snapshot of the activities that we do during an event. Um, COVID has been a bit different, but we've done many of these activities as well as many others. Um, I do wanna make sure that I mentioned the image on the right is from Rx Open, which is our pharmacy status reporting tool that actually now reports on the status of pharmacies as well as dialysis centers during disasters. So with that, just like to make sure that you know what you're in for. And so the agenda um, just walks you through what to expect during the session. Um, but please note that um, the Q&A um, really is something that we are making sure that there's time for. And so with that, um, we'll just begin with an overview and then go into discussion about the supply chain for these products. Um, and then we'll, we'll have the special opportunity to hear perspectives from two providers um, from different hospital um, and health system settings. And then we will address the questions that come into the Q&A. Very pleased to be able to be joined this afternoon um, by, by three exceptional colleagues, um, all um, fantastic resources um, and, and just a treasure trove of information related to COVID and especially the, the monoclonal antibody therapeutics. Um, we have Dr. Trisha Coleman, who serves as the Senior Director of Medical Affairs for Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. We have Dr. Melissa Fiorini, who is the director of the monoclonal antibody infusion clinic at St. Peter's Health Partners, and Dr. Mark Jarrett, a longtime partner of Healthcare Ready's, who's the chief quality officer for Northwell Health. 
And again, just thank you all for taking the time to be here with us today. With that, I'm just wanting to start with this, this overview and jump right in. Um, COVID-19 um, is a changing situation. We are starting to see the number of cases um, decline and the hospitalizations decline. Um, there is some concern from the public health community that as um, political leadership um, begin to relax some of the recommendations that um, are helping us to control um, case counts and hospitalizations that um, we may see an uptick, but right now um, trending in the right direction. Um, there have been multiple variants that have emerged um, with evolving data. Um, the one that we've spent the most time thinking about is the UK variant, but also the South Africa variant and Brazil variants are being tracked very closely. Um, there's a lot of data still being gathered on, on the variants, specifically um, how the variants um, impact existing therapies um, and the EUA approved vaccines. Um, but we, we do know that that research is ongoing. Next slide, please. While we continue to navigate this pandemic, um, we really think that the, this particular conversation is important, recognizing that monoclonal antibodies are one of the, the many tools that can help to um, protect patients that are at highest risk for COVID-19 um, and, and have been used over the last few months to really make sure that we are avoiding prolonged hospitalizations and defraying some of the burden on hospital systems um, throughout the pandemic. And so understanding um, when and how um, to consider the use of monoclonal antibodies along that patient pathway is very important. Um, we are seeing that the therapeutics um, are, are helping in being able to treat patients who have been diagnosed with COVID um, and reducing hospitalizations. And so these conversations we hope are um, an additional opportunity to learn more and consider how to um, consider these, these products as tools in the toolbox, recognizing that um, we still have a long way to go before the pandemic is over and, and making sure that we have the ability to use all of these available therapeutics is going to be important um, for healthcare, but also for public health. Next slide, please. So with that, just giving a very quick overview, focusing on first the care pathways, the role and value of the monoclonal antibodies, and then patient eligibility, and then turning it over to our speakers. So we do know that um, for COVID-19 monoclonal antibody treatment, there are a few steps that have to be completed within the first 10 days. Um, that 10 day window, very important because there is recognition um, and data suggesting that the earlier um, in the di post diagnosis, the better it is for um, the infected individual. Um, so the steps are um, just first a positive test and then the prescription for an infusion, identification of an infusion site, um, scheduling the infusion, and then being able to um, actually administer treatment. Um, one of the, the biggest pieces that we do want to underscore is being able to proactively identify and alert high-risk patients um, after immediately post um, positive test is incredibly important. Um, so we, ex we are hoping to be able to hear more about that um, as we continue, but that's really an opportunity is making sure that within those 10 days that as many patients that would be eligible um, are being um, given the opportunity to get the prescription and have um, an infusion um, site identified for them to be able to schedule and then receive treatment. Next slide, please. So, um, and I, I know that Dr. Coleman will go into this in greater detail, um, but we, we know that the antibody medicines are derived um, from patients who have recovered um, or from um, animal models that um, have been exposed to the virus and have generated an immune response that has um, allowed for um, the antibodies to be created. So that's where antibody medicines come from, vaccines, um, a slightly different path of being using either weakened or attenuated virus, um, fragments of a virus um, or a deactivated virus. Um, we also have the um, RNA or DNA of the virus that ha has been used even with the 
the two current um, EUA approved vaccines, um, just as an example, um, to be able to generate a vaccine. I do want to pause here, recognizing that um, Dr. Coleman um, may also have a few points that she would like to make on this slide. So Dr. Coleman, I'm happy to open the floor to you for remarks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you, you uh, hit this very, very consistently. Um, I just want to draw attention to the fact that, you know, vaccines are really used to um, prevent infection where the monoclonal antibodies are being used to treat uh, an infection um, after it has occurred. Um, so it's, it's really a multi-pronged approach to fighting the pandemic by having uh, both of these options available to us. Thank you. Next slide, please. And so with this, and I, I know that um, Dr. Coleman, as I prepare to turn the floor over to you, um, you just made this point, but I, I do want to, um, as we transition, just make the point that, um, you know, we do have these two, two types of tools, but there are um, other available therapies that we do want to make note of that are um, being used at, for patients along different steps of COVID-19 infection. And so uh, we will spend a little bit of time talking about this, um, but really wanting to um, open the floor for our wonderful speakers. Um, Dr. Coleman, turning it over to you to, to provide this insight as well as an overview of the monoclonal antibody supply chain. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so to just reiterate um, what I just said, um, vaccines prevent new infections, whereas the new therapies um, treat already infected patients. So we're not trying to advocate or take away from the importance of the vaccines, but rather fill an, a different gap um, for those who either are, don't, or don't have access to the vaccine and get infected or have received the vaccines and, and get infected, um, which we are seeing as well. Um, so both of these are important tools in fight, fighting the pandemic. Um, and for patients that are hospitalized due to COVID-19 and require supplemental oxygen, the only treatments currently available are remdesivir with or without varicitinib and dethamexasone. Um, for patients who are uh, not hospitalized due to COVID-19 um, and do not require supplemental oxygen, there, there are now three monoclonal antibody therapies available under the FDA's emergency use authorization. And those incl include the combination of casirivimab, casirivimab and endevimab, um, bamlanivimab, and then the combination of bamlanivimab with edisivimab. Um, that, those three are all available to high-risk patients now. Um, so the two, two groups that we've separated out here are mild to moderate, mild to moderate hospitalized patients um, who are at high risk but are not hospitalized due to COVID-19 and do not require supplemental oxygen. Um, those patients can receive any of these monoclonal antibody therapies if they are at high risk. And then also our ambulatory patients that are not hospitalized but have COVID-19 um, can receive the antibody therapies. Um, I do want to mention that at least for one of the antibodies, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee found clear clinical efficacy on reducing the rate of hospitalization and death um, and recommended stopping enrollment into the placebo group for the ongoing trial. Um, so the data continues to be strong for these monoclonal antibody treatments, um, and we'll continue to see more data uh, as time moves on. So if you want to move on to the next slide. So here you can see those patients that are classified at high risk. Uh, the EUA is for adults and children 12 years of age and older, 40 kilograms or greater, and have positive SARS-CoV-2 viral test. Um, and then they're at high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19 and or hospitalization. Uh, the risk factors are shown here on the right, and they include patients that have severe comorbid conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, CKD, suppressed immune system, and so on. Um, also considered a high risk um, are those patients who are 55 years of age and older um, who have, have risk factors such as cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and COPD, for example. For those patients who are younger, 
um, between 12 and 17, you can see the um, list of risk factors that would put those patients at um, eligibility. So I think I'll move into the um, monoclonal antibody supply chain. Uh, if you want to go to the next, yes, yeah, perfect. Um, so we'll talk about the role of government in allocation and flow, direct ordering through SPR and locator tools. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the supply chain for antibody therapies. Um, the federal government has purchased all available antibody therapies and has made them available to sites wishing to receive um, and, and make available to their patients um, with at no cost to the provider. Um, historically, Health and Human Services and ASPR determined allocation amounts for the states and state health departments um, were then in charge of uh, allocations at the state level, but I'm happy to say that there is no longer a need for the federal government to allocate these medicines to healthcare, health departments, and sites can now order directly from the distributor Amerisource Bergen. Again, the products remain free of charge to requesting sites to administer to patients that meet the EUA criteria, and you can see the link to um, the order processes on the, on the slide, which will be provided to you um, after this meeting. All right, so if you move to the next slide. Can you move to the next slide, please? Oh, thank you. Um, so this slide just reiterates um, the government procurement process um, to, for antibody therapies. Um, essentially, it's saying the same thing as the last slide, but I want to reiterate here that sites wishing to provide monoclonal antibodies to their patients are now able to directly contact Amerisource Bergen for supply. And while the government is still monitoring and controlling allocation, and requires tracking of doses and quantities administered with direct ordering significantly streamlines the process of obtaining the medicine. So if you move to the next slide, please. Um, here's a bit more information about the direct ordering through Health and Human Services and ASPR. Actually, if you go to the previous slide, please. So the goal of Health and Human Services is to ensure fair and efficient access of monoclonal antibody treatments to communities and facilities that need them. Um, the treatments remain free of charge to requesting sites that meet EUA criteria. Um, and the links are provided in um, for the overview of direct ordering and the link to direct order um, actually in the, the next slide. So I think I'll turn it back over to Nicolette and Healthcare Ready for the remainder of the slides. Thank you. I, I think um, there was a little bit of a lag. So as you were asking to advance the slides, if we could stay on this slide where um, um, if we could actually just go back to that last slide, just to show the direct ordering link. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to see that and knows where to look for it when we send the slides out. Um, so at the bottom of that slide, um, thank you so much, Trisha, for um, making that point. You'll see those two direct ordering links there. Um, again, they will be included in the information that you receive. Um, so now let's go to the next slide um, and um, discuss where, um, how to learn more about where the treatments are. Um, there are two tools that we want to make sure that you all are aware of. Um, one, um, a great tool that's been created by HHS ASPR to locate um, therapies. Um, it's the um, HHS site and that URL is there as well. Um, but also our friends at NICA have created a tool that's really more oriented towards patients. Um, that is an infusion locator tool. Um, it, it is um, actually a longstanding tool. Um, we know we've referenced it during many disasters that is also being used to help patients identify where to find COVID-19 monoclonal antibodies. Next slide, please. Just want to spend a, a minute talking about the SPEED program. Um, SPEED, which stands for Special Projects for Equitable and Efficient Distribution, um, is the program that is supporting the federal allocation of the COVID-19 therapeutics um, to um, facility types that, that care for high-risk populations. 
Um, so just wanting to make sure that that is separate and complementary to the state-based monoclonal antibody um, allocation process. Um, and facilities will have to demonstrate that they have the capability to receive, prepare, and administer monoclonal antibodies, as well as the ability to monitor for any effusion, infusion-related adverse um, actions or um, interactions and FQHCs specifically making the note, knowing that a lot of um, you on the line are representing FQHCs. Um, those that do not have these capabilities have the ability to partner with um, community hospitals um, or local infusion centers to be eligible for the program. Um, the priority groups that um, are really being um, emphasized through the SPEED program are on the slide on the right, um, making a special point to note that it does include long-term care, dialysis, and correctional facilities, as well as the FQHCs. So to the next slide, um, very pleased to be able to turn the floor um, first over to Dr. Melissa Fiorini to provide her perspectives on um, running the monoclonal antibody infusion clinic at St. Peter's Health Partners in Albany, New York. Dr. Fiorini, over to you. Hello, just trying to see, can you see me? We can see you. Okay, good. I can't see myself, so I don't know if I'm in the screen. We um, can see so you and you look great. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me today. I am Melissa Fiorini. I'm the director of the MAB Infusion Clinic at St. Peter's Health Partners. Um, St. Peter's Health Partners constitutes four hospitals, two of which are acute care that have inpatient beds, and we have about 700 beds between those two facilities. And then we have two outpatient campuses um, that one is equipped with an emergency department, but if there's admissions, they get forwarded to the other two hospitals. We um, jumped on this early when we heard that there was gonna be an EUA at the end of November. And we had two weeks of meetings. And by December 3rd, we had our first full infusion day with 10 patients. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what led us to a successful clinic. Um, however, some of the things that we learned early on are no longer something that people wanting to start up a clinic would have to worry about just because there is marketing and increased knowledge for providers and um, patients that this actually exists. But in the beginning, we started off by inviting the other hospitals in our region to pool resources um, and join us to have all of the infusions out of one infusion center. We um, did have a couple of the hospitals think that was a good idea, but then when it became clear that the monoclonal antibodies were gonna be distributed every couple of weeks, and this is something that was gonna last months, then one of the hospitals took it upon themselves to do their own clinic. And then the other hospitals joined with us until they could get a clinic running and then went off on their own. Um, we always had the idea that it was all about the patients and just serving as many patients as we could. So first you have to decide who's going to run the clinic. Um, I am emergency medicine trained, but at the time I was working in urgent care and emergency medicine. And then I also have a critical care degree and I'm familiar with our ICUs, work there and know the people there as well. So it seemed perfect that I had access to all of the major hospital points where COVID patients were treated. Um, I would say for anyone looking to start a clinic to have someone that's in the acute care setting that has access to patient positive spreadsheets is key, especially in the beginning, because at the beginning, our patients were made up of nursing home patients. And then literally I would go through the positives from the ERs and the positives from our urgent cares and call them up and explain to them what the treatment was and get them on the schedule. Um, it's also important to have someone in-house that can help you with the details of an infusion center because that's not something an emergency person would normally be involved with. And it's great if they have a vested interest in it, their patient population is one of the high risk. So infectious disease or nephrology, oncology or pulmonary would be great partners to do this with. I was very fortunate in that the CMO that served as my mentor and partner was the head of our infectious disease as well. 
And so we were able to, you know, cross all the bases, whatever one of us was familiar with, you know, the other one could lean on the, their familiarity and their knowledge base. So once you decide who's going to run the infusion clinic, um, I believe that it's important to have the support from the entire hospital system. I don't think one department, whether it's the ER or pulmonary can do this on their own. Again, I was very fortunate in that our chief clinical officer um, tagged the following departments to get on the first phone call meeting to set this up and give me all the support that we needed. So we had finance, registration, nursing, pharmacy, the emergency department, and then later the medical group practice and corporate communications to get the word out. Once you find who's going to run the program, it's all about location, location, location. So finding the right location for this clinic was paramount. And we were very fortunate to have in one of the campuses that I said was more of an outpatient, we still have a functioning ER and their fast track area was not being used. So we had an eight bed area that had monitors that was equipped to have patients with a separate entrance and was on the first floor that was absolutely ideal to having highly infectious COVID patients come into. <clears throat> the other bonus to that was that it's adjacent to the ER. So if there's any concern of an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, the ER attending comes right over and is on the phone with me and we deal with you know how to solve the problem. Um, also, you're dealing with a sick population who are usually very um, febile themselves with a lot of comorbidities. So sometimes by the time patients get from their car to the bed and they're a chronic COPD or and now they're very sick and dehydrated, you know, their vital signs sometimes aren't very stable when they arrive to that bed. And so it's good to have that partnership between myself and the ER physician so that we can assess them, see if we wanna proceed and who needs to be admitted. Once you find the location, you need staff. And we were fortunate to tag our nurse manager of our regular infusion units. So without missing a step, she was able to staff our units, know exactly how much staff she needed, what timings you know, for each patient was gonna be available. Um, you're setting it up for a total of three hours by the time the nurse gets the line in, then it's a one hour infusion, a one hour observation period. And so I tell patients about two and a half, three hours that they're going to be there. Um, so we had at first two nurses that were familiar with the infusion units, eight hour days, five days a week, which quickly led to three nurses, 12 hour days, one, P one L LPN and one tech. Um, because eight weeks into this at our peak, we were seeing 80 patients a week. The other thing that's very important for this infusion center is um, referrals and scheduling. Because now that you have the staff, you have the location, you have all these resources going to it, you do not want a lot of days that only have three patients and you're wasting resources. So there's a lot of pressure to constantly be plugging patients into the schedule, which quite frankly is a 24 seven um, job at first, I would say. And the biggest thing that we did to make that easier on me, as it was, was to have a centralized referral system through a website. So now we have it so that everyone who wants to refer a patient goes to mab.sphp.com. The referral goes in with everything I need. So all of the things that we would want to follow for um, demographics and clinical purposes are in there for them to check BMI cardiac disease, et cetera. And then it generates an email that goes to the patient with the EUAs attached to it so that that part of the patient understanding what they're getting is fulfilled. And then it also generates an email back to the providers, letting them know that their patient has been scheduled. So if, again, anyone was looking to do something like this, getting IT on board and making something that's easy for someone to come in and do a half a day of scheduling for you if you have something else to do 
um, is key. At first, I would say that we needed a clinical person to do the scheduling because again, I was literally calling patients up. Sometimes they didn't even know they were positive yet from the urgent care or the emergency department. And I was explaining to them, this is what you have. This is what we have available for you to have treatment. Would you like me to schedule you? And as my mom would say, if you called me, I would hang up on you because who thinks a doctor is going to call and just want to give treatment for coronavirus? So that was a, you know, about a 20 minute per patient ordeal every time we scheduled someone. Once word got out, once providers are familiar with it, patients are familiar with it, then it became referrals. And next thing I know, patients didn't want to hear anything from me. They just want to know what time to show up. So that was very nice. Um, who do you infuse? The criteria are there and have already been addressed in this lecture, but when you're setting something up, especially in the beginning, it was, do you just service the patients that belong to your hospital system? Do you just service your primary care providers? Um, from the beginning, it, it, that was always a tough one because this is a govern, government um, purchased medication to help all of the people in our nation. And yes, we're putting all of the resources into it, but we wanna serve as many people as possible. So at first it was, we were giving priority to our primary care physicians that were a part of our hospital group, but we considered anyone who came through the ER and anyone who came through the urgent care our patients. And therefore we were able to bring in patients that don't have PCPs or didn't have PCPs with us. Um, having that said, that was a very brief time. Once it became clear that this was a ongoing um, therapeutic that was going to be used for months and months and months, um, we quickly made the decision that we just have to treat whoever's referred. And, and, it, and it went by kind of a scoring system and who was closer to that 10 day period. And because we increased our hours to where we could do 90 a week, we, we really never turned anyone away. Um, the idea of um, treating whoever's referred, everyone, when they talk about it, talk about having a prescription or having the PCP involved. While I do always want the PCP involved, so for instance, if someone's on the urgent care list of positives and I talk to them and I say, you know, you're positive, we're gonna get you in. I do ask them to go back to their PCP to put in that referral because I want them to know the treatment's happening. I want them to be able to follow up with the patient. Um, so that's how we solve that aspect of it, of having, you know, I'm the provider that's ordering the, the treatment, but, you know, for patients who don't have a PCP or patients whose PCP weren't aware of the treatment, that's, that's how we, we had them go back and then send the referral in. Um, finally, the way to look at treating acute patients that are high risk for coronavirus, um, and also maybe someday it'll it'll be opened up to a wider uh, variety of patients. Y you have to think of it as a new model. Before we were saying, you know, stay home, don't worry about the tests. Assume you have it. Go to the ER if you're very sick or feel like you're not breathing well. And within two weeks, that whole paradigm changed to as soon as you have symptoms, if you're high risk please get a test as soon as possible because a lot of the testing centers had 24 to 72 hours turnaround time. And what was useful, again, me being both in urgent care and in the emergency department, we were able to quickly switch from if patients are being discharged, they don't need a test. They only need a test if they're going to be hospitalized to make sure that they're isolated and we don't infect other people in the hospital to if they are going to be discharged and they have these um, comorbidities, please test because I can't infuse without a test. Um, the other thing about early testing, which I think is the key take home for everybody is just please tell your patients who are at high risk to get tested as soon as possible. What we do have is we have the ability to do a rapid test. Um, we don't want to become a testing center, but for instance, I may call an 80 year old who was referred and then find out that his 78 year old wife also has symptoms and she's waiting from the urgent care for her test. And because I know the urgent care sometimes can be, you know, 48 to 72 hours, 
I'll tell them just come, we'll do the rapid on her. Um, if it's positive, she, she can get infused. We don't have to wait for the test. And I think out of the three months that I've been doing that, we've only had two negative POCs that we had to say, okay, now you have to go back and, you know, get a PCR, which they did do. And they both ended up positive and then we rescheduled them. Um, finally, um, we do want to talk about the uninsured and, you know, patients who don't have um, the access to a healthcare system, like uh, some of us are very fortunate to do. And we do feel that we have touched on those places with the ER and urgent cares, but we, you know, also had homeless patients who couldn't go back to their shelters that social work was setting up to go to a COVID hotel. And we found a hotel that was in walking distance to the clinic so that if they went to the hotel, they could literally walk themselves over to the clinic, get their infusion, and then return back. Um, we're on the stage now that we have a setup that's very functional and successful in advertising, um, provider education, patient education. So some of the ways to do that are forums like this, media, um, I call it the Trump effect. Um, I tell people whatever your political advocation is, it's very um, understandable because everybody knows that the former president was admitted to the hospital and received a cocktail and did well. So it helps them understand and put a, a real face on it. Um, and that's about it. We'll leave it open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fiorini, and I am certainly going to borrow that one from you because I think you make a great point about the fact that once people saw the president um, receive the cocktail, it humanized it in a particular way. So thank you for that. Um, and I, I know that we've opened up the Q&A so that we can begin to collect questions. Um, and with that, we're going to um, turn to Dr. Mark Jarrett from Northwell Health to offer his perspective, and then we'll go into open Q&A. Dr. Jarrett, over to you. Thank you. So first of all, that was a great talk by Dr. Fiorini and covered a lot of the things that I would cover, uh, but uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a few other areas. Uh, so first of all, uh, Northwell Health is a uh, integrated health system in the New York metropolitan area. We're 23 hospitals that kind of range from the tip of Long Island all the way up to Northern Westchester. So we kind of cover a, uh, a large swath of land uh, with lots of people. Uh, in addition, uh, myself, I'm the chief quality officer. I've been one of the clinical leads through all of COVID. And um, I'm a rheumatologist by trade and have run an infusion center. So this was not a great leap for me to figure out you know, what was necessary, but I'll go into some details on that. Um, when the infusions were being talked about potentially with the EUA, which then came a week after they first talked about it, uh, we started immediately planning for this. And the reason why we felt it was important is, you know, there are two aspects to, to this treatment. One is clearly it reduces hopefully mortality uh, and, and, and severe disease in the patients. And that's always our, you know, our guiding light is we want to make patients better. But just as importantly, it seems to prevent severe disease and perhaps even ICU admission. And what we went through back in the spring of last year, uh, when we had over 800 patients on ventilators in our hospitals, uh, we recognized that anything we could do, especially as this second surge occurred, uh, anything we could do to reduce uh, patients coming into the hospital, uh, using beds, resources, not only will help our ability to handle COVID, but would all more, more importantly, just as, or just as importantly, help us handle patients who have routine heart failure, heart problems, strokes, et cetera, which clearly went a lot by the wayside during uh, uh, the spring uh, event. So we felt that this was really something important to do. Uh, we use an incident command system, so we had both the clinical and the operational people work together, logistics people. Uh, and uh, by Thanksgiving, we actually had set up our uh, first infusion center. We used a uh, medical tent that was on the campus of one of our tertiary hospitals, which had been set up uh, as overflow last year, uh, was still kept up and it's still there uh, just in case. 
uh, but right now was not needed for beds. So we brought in infusion equipment, et cetera, and established it there. Um, the first infusion center, we also um, uh, harnessed a couple of the nurses who were infusion nurses for our rheumatology area and our chemotherapy areas. We're very used to giving uh, antibody therapies uh, and they taught other nurses who were gonna be manning it on a regular basis what to do and how to do it. Uh, they trained them, made sure the competence was were there, uh, trained them what to do in terms of reaction. Uh, very similar to with St. Peter's, uh, since it was on the campus, if a patient did have a problem, we can call a rapid response. People can run right over from the emergency room, which was 100 feet away, uh, and we can bring the patient to the emergency room. But thankfully, uh, that occurred not due to the infusions, but due to one or two patients developing medical problems irrespective, just coincidentally, while, while they were there. In the beginning, we didn't advertise a lot for this or let people know about it. We worked with our faculty, but didn't go wider because we were afraid of being overwhelmed, didn't know what supplies were gonna be. Uh, neither of those became an issue in the beginning. So one of the things we did was push this out to all the community physicians, uh, got word out in the newspapers so that the public was aware of it, as well as the physicians for referrals. Uh, we um, appointed uh, a primary care physician to act as the medical director for our whole infusion program for this. Uh, and uh, that person actually was the physician ordering all the, all the things. We had a standing order, uh, but we did, um, we did have referrals from, the, from doctors out in the community, and we really pushed that so they'd be aware of it. Uh, we had a call center, which we established for other reasons, including obviously vaccinations. So we utilize a number, special number after the call center, off the call center, just for infusions that people can make appointments. So again, that we didn't have empty slots, which was not what we wanted. Uh, we started the first, uh, first one in Thanksgiving and quickly over the next uh, month established four more infusion centers. So they were geographically spread. Uh, and up until this point, we've done approximately 4,000 infusions already uh, throughout our system. Now, one of the issues that you have to recognize, especially for an urban or sub very suburban area, is many people, especially underserved people, do not have cars. And therefore, how do they get to the infusion center? And this was a real problem. Uh, they came, we don't want them taking public transportation. They're at the most infectious point in their disease. Uh, and they may not be able to get a family member to take them who would feel safe taking them. Uh, so between that and the fact that a lot of the underserved use the emergency room, unfortunately, as their only point of access to the medical care system, we then decide to expand this to the emergency rooms. And we now have seven, actually nine of our emergency rooms uh, being able to deliver the monoclonal antibody. Now, these are people who come into the emergency room uh, because they have symptoms, not because they were referred there for treatment. Uh, if they have symptoms and they qualify for monoclonal antibodies, if they have transportation or there is no issue about getting them to an infusion center in the next 24 hours, we would send them out and have them go to an infusion center. But anybody who doesn't have transportation, maybe an older person who's homebound, we would then uh, do the infusion in the emergency room. Uh, we had a special area set off in each emergency room. We, can't, we couldn't be inundated with lots of patients through the emergency room because our emergency rooms are overfilled to begin with, especially as we started a second resurgence. Uh, but we felt that this would offer some way we can offset some of the equity issues that occur with these infusions. We also have done a few infusions in uh, the nursing homes. However, I will tell you now that uh, vaccination has occurred throughout the nursing homes. That appears to be less of an issue. We had thought about doing home infusions. And the problem with home infusions is that it would take two nurses uh, and maybe they can get two patients done a day if they have to travel between sites. And we felt that staff utilization was probably not appropriate at this point in time uh, because with, this, with the surge we were having uh, in December and January and early February and now it's finally abating, uh, we were concerned about staffing even in the hospital. So we did not feel that was appropriate. I will tell you now uh, that we are seeing a decrease in number of people 
eligible because so many more people, because the prevalence is going down, people are getting vaccinated. Uh, but we feel this is still important to how it's going to play out with variants and the different uh, infusion medications we will have to see. But we feel that at this point, we're still continuing this uh, just in case prevalence pops up. Um, and finally, I would uh, you know just point out that not only having this call center to do it, uh, we had a triage at every, even if they had physician referrals, we had triage uh, on entry. Uh, we learned from errors. For example, we had a patient who had occasional AFib, came in, uh, due for their infusion, uh, but was noted to be in nuanced AFib. They decided to give the infusion anyway. The patient tolerated, but his rate increased. He wound up being transferred to the emergency room. Um, we've kind of decided that people who have an active problem at that time uh, will not be treated. Uh, we're accumulating all our data. It appears now, and not that we've done a randomized study, but just based on our experience, uh, that the mortality rate is way reduced in these patients who have gotten these infusions. And again, these are the people who are more likely, more likely to go on to severe disease as well as the fact that we believe we've had less ICU admissions. Uh, so we believe we have helped the patients. We've probably taken a little bit of pressure off of our uh, hospitals and we feel this is a valuable tool, just one tool that we have, but it's a valuable tool, which we have learned a lot how to do and may become important again with new antibodies that come out uh, as we continue to fight COVID. Uh, I know the uh, hour is getting late, and I know that there are a lot of questions. So, uh, Nicolette, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jarrett. And um, really looking forward to digging into these questions with you and Dr. Fiorini. Um, there are a couple of them that I think we might be able to combine. So I'll just ask if you both could turn your videos back on um, and I will um, throw the questions out and um, welcome you both um, jumping in. I'm just gonna try to organize these a little bit. I think the first one um, that we should tackle is a question that states that now that the hospitalizations and case rates are decreasing, are you still seeing an adequate number of patients eligible for monoclonal antibody therapy? I'll be glad to go first. We, you know, as I mentioned, we're starting to see uh, the numbers coming in less. We still feel that uh, at the most we might do is if we have the open spots is maybe move, change our, our hours of operation a little bit. We've been running this 24, you know, uh, for about 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I believe also it may still be worth it because it's not like COVID has disappeared to really push this issue out to the public more than just referring doctors to make them aware of this modality uh, because we do have the uh, capacity now. I, I would say that we've seen a little bit of a downtick. Um, we uh, flattened out a little bit and then went up again and we weren't sure if that was the first dose of vaccine because almost everyone we were seeing was elderly who had their first dose of vaccine. I'm not sure if they're getting it when they go to get the vaccine or if they're a little more comfortable to go out after the first dose of vaccine. And then the Super Bowl uptick, we had a little bit too. Um, also, we're, other areas are doing infusions now. So I do think some of the decrease is because other people have expanded their hours. Um, but we're, we're steady. We're not doing 12 hour shifts, but we're still doing about 40 to 50 a week when we were doing 80 much smaller than what Dr. Jarrett has going on in Long Island, but you know, for a small area, um, it, those, those were our numbers. Very helpful, thank you. Um, we've got two questions that seem to be versions of each other. Um, so um, wanting to, to really tackle, um, take um, the cocktail versus in individual antibodies, um, and we're, we're being asked to discuss the use of bamlivimab alone versus in, in, um, in combination, um, but also um, just to dovetail to that, any concern about administering it alone based on potential resistance to variants? I'll go first because I'm in Albany and um, I, I don't know that we've seen variants as much here as maybe New York City or Long Island may be exposed to them just because of the sheer number of airports and international travel and whatnot. So I, I think the idea and the, the you know, 
drug companies can speak better to this is that if you have two antibodies working on the virus, then it's harder for the mutations to occur that will change its efficacy um, rather than just one. But um, certainly if we were to have a, another surge and we're starting to find it's the Brazilian strain or you know, we can get that information, then we would probably start to try to change a little bit from going to single to double. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I would I would exactly say the same thing. I mean, single worries us a little bit now with the variants. Uh, we're still using the single BAM. We found that the duplicate way of doing it from the pharmacy and preparation wise, uh, uh, you know, we are a little bit of a problem. Uh, but uh, you know, I think dual therapies make the more sense with what's going on today with variations. Thank you. Um, one question about um, actually initiating the program in the emergency department, and I know you both spoke to this from different vantage points. Um, um, the question is, um, we're planning to initiate our program in our emergency department as we do not have an infusion center. In your opinion, should the patients be fully evaluated in the ED and then given treatment, or should they just be referred to the ED for treatment only? I'll let our ED physician talk about what they would do. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, and just like when Dr. Jerry was talking about transportation, it is a nightmare for patients who not only do not have a car, but um, elderly and, and the only transportation that will do COVID around here does it with an ambulance. So it's 190 round trip, which people just don't have. So, you know, we're, we're working to get funds to, to account for that in the patient population that we see. Um, so doing it in the ER does make sense. I think that if, if I were running an ER, I would say that they should just be referred to get the infusion and not the full evaluation because that's just time that's wasted if we already know what the patient needs. Um, some of the promising studies though, showing that the medications are safe to be given over 16 minutes, is a game changer for ER use, you know, it, rather than a two and a half hour period, you're talking 15 minutes infused and then an hour observation. So I do think that when we have lower numbers, that's not a hard thing to tackle. Um, so I would say that they should be referred only. And then the ER physician is there if there's any complications and you could have the, the, the provider that's referring and writing the order still be responsible for small questions. And only if they're unstable and you think that they need to be admitted, then, then you talk it over with the ER doctor, which is what we did. I think she answered the question perfectly adequately. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so um, a, this is a statement, but I, I do want to also pose it as um, a best practice. Um, um, one of our colleagues says, in planning this type of program, please be sure to include the pharmacy right from the beginning. Um, can you guys speak to how you worked with your pharmacies as you rolled out the program? Sure. Uh, you know, you know, as I said, you know, we we've been we have a clinical advisor group and an operations team that works on all these things, including our physical plant people to make sure ventilation is right. It's safe for our employees there. Uh, so we kind of put that all together. And a critical person, because these are medications, are is the pharmacy both in terms of mixing, preparation, uh, safety. You know, uh, what you know because of supplies, it might be one center working this week with uh, one product and the next week with another product. So uh, having our pharmacy people be involved right from the beginning was critical, as well as nursing leadership, because obviously you're dealing with having nurses do infusions, which is not something with antibodies that we normally do in the hospital. Uh, and there aren't certainly enough infusion nurses uh, from let's say rheumatology or cancer that you can steal. Uh, so you need to have them involved. Uh, you know, you need to have IT involved right from the beginning because where are you gonna document this? Where are you gonna order it? How are you putting it into the system so that, they, that you have a good record? Um, so I would do that. And then quite frankly, I always have legal involved to look at the consenting process and what you're doing, uh, just because it's better to have them bless it now than later on start telling you why you're doing it this way. Uh, so that, that you know, so you really need a team to put this together as if you're building a whole new ambulatory site, except you're doing it in a couple of days. 
Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate you using that opportunity to describe all of the partnerships that come into play in order to um, really roll out a successful program. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to, to ask the two questions. I know there's a follow up and we'll try to get to it, but um, two questions and welcome your reflections on both. One being, uh, what are your strategies for increasing education to communities about the availability and the benefits of monoclonal antibodies? Um, and then the second being, now that the high-risk population is beginning to be um, vaccinated, how are you managing patients who either recently had the vaccine prior to testing positive or would like to receive the vaccine after receiving the monoclonal antibody infusion? Let's go first. Yeah. Huh? Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of educating the public, um, what we've been doing now is working with our public relations people, you know, they, they get the local newspapers to do interviews, things like that, because sometimes, you know, not everybody reads the New York Times every morning, uh, but people in most communities read their local community newspaper and often get their health information from it. So we've been doing, uh, having some of our team uh, talk to people about this so they're aware of it and, and they know about it. So that, that's getting the word out to the public. That's probably the best way. Uh, and in terms of the vaccine, obviously if somebody coincidentally got vaccinated on Monday and Wednesday gets sick with COVID, which happens in a number of cases, uh, if they qualify for the monoclonals, we recommend they get the monoclonals. Uh, they'll, oh, wait, there'll be plenty of vaccine three months from now. I worry less about that and more about the fact that otherwise you're playing Russian roulette, that if you have that high risk uh, status that you can go on to severe disease. Uh, first of all, if you just got the back, the first, the first dose on Monday, you're not gonna, even if you're gonna get efficacy from it, you're not gonna see it for two weeks. Uh, so, you know, it's better to treat what you can right now and then later on follow it up with the vaccine. Although I will tell you there are patients who are refusing to take the monoclonals because they're convinced that the vaccine is the only way to go. And we try to educate them why that isn't necessarily the best process to follow. So I, I would echo everything that um, doctor just said. The, from my chat groups with the fellow emergency medicine uh, physicians of ASAP, I think we've all come to the conclusion that what's out there is that if you've had the first and or second dose of vaccine, you still can get the monoclonal antibody infusion. Right. Um, the other way around is that if you get the infusion, you're supposed to wait for 90 days. It is some to get the vaccine. It is something that patients are concerned about. And when I explain to them that the CDC still recommends that if you have COVID, you're to wait 90 days to get the vaccine, then they feel a little bit better about it, even though that's not the practice. And, and some people are saying one month or two months, it's all based on whether we still have the antibodies in our system, right? So we know that the half-life with the antibody infusions are something like 23 or 22 days. So that's why 90 days later, it should all be out of your system. What we don't know is how quickly our antibodies that we make because we've had the disease are leaving our system. But we do know that some people tested after three months do not have the antibodies any longer. So I think that's where the, it, the question is um, clinic or medically or academically is maybe you can get it one month later because you don't have the antibodies any longer. Um, there's no great research saying one way or the other, but they, they, they are hesitant not to get the vaccine right away. But once you explain that the antibodies are still in their system and that's what the CDC recommends, they're okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And so with that, I know we are one minute over time. I just would love to thank you both again for taking the time. I know you've been hard at work um, at your respective facilities, and we just really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights and, and be able to answer the questions from our partners. Um, and so with that, just want to remind everyone, um, stay tuned for future information. We will be emailing out the, um, the notes from this as well as some resources. And there was one outstanding question in the queue. I've sent you a message. And if you can send us your email address, we'll make sure that you can get an answer to that question. With that, thank you all um, and have a wonderful day. Stay Thanks, safe. everyone. Thank Bye. you for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.